All right, welcome to another episode of the Fair Chase podcast. Today, we have a very special guest with us, um, a guy who remotely, virtually has made me feel a lot of pain over the last two weeks. Uh, his name is Dustin. I'm not going to even try to pronounce your last name. Dierfendorf? Dierfendorfer. Dierfendorfer? Jimmy uh, slaughtered that yeah, one. Yeah, that's my bad. That's why I didn't want to say it. Um, and Dustin... You definitely tomorrow morning you'll you'll hurt me again. I'm uh, on week two of the uh, kettlebell workout, so it's it's pretty good. I've seen you in the app. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Now I I started like looking around at all of them. I'm like I'm gonna start with this one's kettlebells. You know it's pretty straightforward. I've got kettlebells. I've been doing like a lot of punching bag and yoga and like yeah. some some running just kind of from the beginning of the new year i got some hunts planned that i wanted to go after and then you know i got onto your app and it's been awesome except some of the the women and i don't mean to sound sexist but like some of the women that you have on absolutely would crush me in all all the things <laughs> yeah we have some very strong females that test these workouts it's crazy they oh, they crush yeah. with the guys all the time a five minute wall squat she did and yeah. with hold, holding weight, and I'm like, I, I took one break, and I felt like a really big man, and I was probably holding less weight than her. And she did five minutes wall squat. It was, or yeah, wall wall squat. It was sit. Awesome. Yeah. Wall sit, sit, sit. I'm sorry, sit. And it didn't sound right coming out. <laughs> so, anyways, Dustin, um, kind of gave away a lot of it, but tell everybody what you do um, and who you are. So I'm the founder of Mountain Tough Fitness Lab. We are out of Bozeman, Montana, and so we started diving into training mountain athletes full-time in 2016. So in 2016, we created a lab here in Bozeman where we could test programming on the world's most dedicated hunters, um, military athletes, and mountain athletes. And then once we're satisfied with the testing, uh, we put that programming online for people to access across the globe. What's up? We are going to thank a few of these sponsors that help make this beautiful show a reality for all of you. So yeah. here we go. So, so a big reason, I would say, to why we're so successful and we have so many bucks on the wall is because we use HuntWise. Uh, HuntWise is a GPS mapping app that you can download on any phone, any platform, you can look up public land huntings, ORV trails. You can get the weather. They actually have a, a HuntCast 2.0 that they teamed up with Jeff Sturgis to make. It's awesome. You need to check this thing out. Go to HuntWise. Download the app. I feel like if you go into the woods without optics, it's like going into the woods without pants on. Would you agree with that? To a point. To a point. <laughs> uh, we are huge fans of running uh, binoculars, uh, spotting scopes, and different things when we hunt, uh, even whitetail. Uh, I bring binoculars out every, every time I go. Uh, we choose Vortex Optics because they make the best glass in the business. They have an amazing warranty, uh, super clear glass, super helpful people that work cool. there. Also, if you want to rep some sweet Vortex swag like this warm shirt on a nice fall day, head over to Vortex Wear. Thank you. And use the promo code TFC24, 20% off your purchase. Saddle game, you need to be in it. If you haven't been in it yet, then you don't know what you're missing. Yeah. Trophy Line Tree Sales makes some of the best saddles in the industry. They have three different platforms that we use and that are awesome. I want to make a quick plug for the wingman with a couple steps. You can take one less step, uh, stick, and it's like a combination of a stick and a platform. I've been exclusively hunting out of it this year, and my mobile setup is so sweet. I'm very proud of it. Awesome. I highly recommend awesome. the Wingman. If, you are, if you're ready to pull the trigger on that and you want to get with James and do the Wingman, head over to their website, and you can save yourself 10% on the purchase. TFC 10 will get you that. I like to think I single-handedly got James to switch to Compound again, but I'd probably be a liar, and everyone would call me out on that. Um we shoot prime bows. We think they're awesome. Great accuracy. Super shootable. Uh, made here in Michigan. Made in Michigan. So we love that. It's hard to complain. That's where Jared was made. So surprisingly, we like that. Yeah. You're welcome. So go check out these prime bows. We are of a firm belief that 
the arrow is the lifeblood of the, the archery, archery industry. industry. We've said it a thousand times. Uh, but in all seriousness, we are huge fans of arrows that are durable, um, that sh- fly well, and that kind of make up for some of my inaccuracies in the way that I shoot. So we shoot vector the custom ha- arrows. The hammer. The hammer. <laughs> That's um, Thor. That's Thor. They are made in Wisconsin uh, by our buddy Isaac. Uh, great arrows. Uh, and if you want to go and get yourself some, have a little bit of a discount, use TFC10 for 10% off. Or call Isaac up and tell him we sent you. Mm-hmm. You want his phone number? Comment below. Yep, comment below. Yeah, you said, I'm just looking at my, my notes here. You said 2016 is when you kind of started putting this together? Yeah, yeah. I started Mountain Tough alone so it's kind of the classic uh american dream bootstrap story for sure so i was sick and tired of a office job i was super bored it was an excellent job but i just did not like um being in the office all day and so kind of dove out on my own with this idea that that someone should be training a hunter with the same degree of interest that like an NFL coach would train an NFL player. Yeah. At, at that time, no one had dove into hunting that deep. And so that was the original vision was what if we broke down the mission of a hunter the same way the NFL coach would break down what an offensive lineman needs to do. Yeah. And so I started alone. Um, I had three guys that I would train in the park by my house. (laughs) All right. (laughs) And I had a buddy create a logo and and hung flyers in all the local bow shops. And then it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And it was local at first. And so it was all Bozeman athletes were coming in for this training. And then once we, once I saw the potential, I created the team. And so the team was definitely, around mental toughness uh so we brought on ara who was a lieutenant colonel army ranger alex who was a navy seal for nine years and then jimmy uh who was the legend in bozeman for training like if you were in bozeman and you wanted to climb everest jimmy was the guy you'd go see really so i created that team in 16 and uh that's when we took everything online yeah, so smart. Good timing with COVID. That had to be kind of nice. I mean, not nice, but obviously kind of nice. Yeah, we'd lucked out with COVID. It was a blessing in terms of we had already created a home gym program about nine months before COVID hit. Yep. And we didn't really want to do that. It was kind of funny. We we were like, who would not train with gym equipment like if you're going to be if you're going to train the world's best mountain athlete you're going to use some equipment and so what happened is we had preseason prep for the backcountry hunter out on the market we had postseason strength for the backcountry hunter Mm -hmm. out on the market and guys started calling and they're like i love this this is phenomenal but what do i do if i'm in a hotel room for a week right and so we are like, oh, we'll create something for you guys. So we created uh, the Mountain Tough 3030, which yep. is 30, 30 days all body weight. And then COVID hit and that the at-home stuff just went through the rough. Is there any re- – I mean, obviously, like, weights are handy because you can do certain movements. But, like, say you're a guy that has, you know, some 20, 30-pound dumbbells, <clears throat> you know, a backpack and, and a pull-up bar, like – with can you get the same results with that or do you really need to have a gym to get to see the the results you would you know with the gym rather than without that was a bad question but you you know what i mean (laughs) yeah (laughs) i think the uh, all the research and studies we have done answer that question in two different ways one is if you're if you're an athlete that's already in a really good shape then you can do a tremendous amount of maintenance with something like a heavy pack or a kettlebell. So if you take someone who's already strength wise, really strong and cardiovascularly doing really well, and you put them through like a 45 day heavy pack training program, Mm -hmm. they'll come out on the other end of that functionally way stronger than they were before. Right. But, 
but someone who's a beginner, um, they can they can do well if all they have access to is body weight or kettlebell or heavy pack. But you just can't you just can't pack a significant amount of muscle on someone scientifically without putting them under those heavier loads. The progression st- type stuff. Yeah. So we always say like absolutely anything is better than nothing. We would we would tell anyone in the world to train with whatever they have. It's always right. going to be, be no training at all. But for someone to get incredibly strong, you need those heavy loads. Right. But for mobility, you know, moving well, I mean, it's, I've, I can, you know, I feel like that's, that's a, that's a big thing. And I would imagine that's what a lot of the people that are coming to to Mountain Tough are really looking for, like that mobility. And what, what I've noticed so far is how many, I mean, dude, I was waiting for at least maybe an arm day, like (laughs) actually, like it's all legs. Like there's, even the times like today I did some pull-ups and push-ups, but still for the most part, like my legs were like hammered. Yeah. 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 We're trying to really, we're trying to really pound that leg endurance. Yeah. So, cause the one thing that makes training a hunter very, very unique, like a, a backcountry hunter is unlike any athlete in the world. The only thing that compares to it is a, ma- a military athlete. Yeah. And even a military athlete isn't always the same. And the thing that separates a backcountry hunter is almost always that they need to they need to pre- perform for three, five, or seven days. Mm-hmm. So if you if you think of someone coming out like someone coming out west to backcountry elk hunt on their own, uh, it's almost always three or five or seven days. Right. And so, there's hardly any other athletes in the world like that, except like an expedition mountaineering team. Even like the special forces are going to be dropped in, perform a mission, and then usually catch a ride out. So yeah. we hammer that leg endurance pretty, pretty hard. But if you think about it, I mean, like, so a hunt, like a, a regular you know, a backcountry hunter, you, like you said, three, five, seven days. I mean, if you can't, everybody can like, you can train a lot of people to do day one really hard and then kind of t- be rested. Cause it's like the marathon or it's the competition or the game or whatever it is. But like yeah. you said, you have to be able to go to sleep, you yeah. know, and not the most ideal situation for sleep and rest with the food. That's usually not even the best at replenishing you. So there's a lot better products out now than there were, but still it's not the same as just laying in your bed after you had a nice warm meal. Right. Um, and so you get to help not only get them strong for that first push, but like recovery has to be able to be quick, a lot quicker yeah. than a lot of other things. Is that about right? Is that right? Yeah. And I think that that was the, one of the biggest things we saw with hunters that were hunting certainly out West for the first time was this theory of bonking on the mountain. So bonking, it, it was like super popular and someone would crush day one and then not be able to get out of the tent on day two. Yeah. And so that is like a really, really common problem. And what we want our athletes to do is just to be able to perform day after day after day so that they don't have to come home early or they don't have to end a dream hunt. And it's, it's sound for people who haven't done any backcountry hunting, like it sounds ridiculous. Like you spent all this time and money and you thought about it and planned for this big hunt and like to go home day two or three sounds ridiculous, but like it happens all the time. You know, I I think of an example, I've talked about it on this podcast before I, I went out and I've got a brother who weight lifts a lot, like heavyweight. He's thick with two C's Jared. And, uh, he, he came out. I'm like, Hey man, you, you should be able to get ready to move and like be able to, um, you know, have shorter recovery times. It's just different. And so he's like, yeah, yeah, I'd be fine. Well, we went out and like, it did not go well for him. He's like, he's got to be close 75 pounds heavier than I am. Yeah. Right? He's a big dude. Um, and day after the first hike in and like the rough sleep, and then we crawl, crawled up even higher to, to scout and everything else, whatever. Uh, by that end of that, he was done. He was, yeah. he was done. And so yep. it's, it's a very different movement a very different type of exercise and like the longevity of it is is the big thing yeah yeah it's it's incredibly common how how that happens to 
way more people than folks realize. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is more than it's like extreme leg endurance, but it's also uh, rugged terrain. There's a ton of stability, a ton of ankle mobility, a ton of uneven rocks and mud and stuff that folks just aren't used to. And so their legs just are smoked and then they just don't want to move that next day. Oh yeah. Jared, even this year, this year we went, uh, on uh, Lake Manitou, North Manitou North Island, Manitou. North Manitou Island. Uh, oh, excuse me. And like, yeah, you really just yawned into that, man. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I just, I just hit a wall here. Yeah. So, but, but the walk out, I mean, we were carrying our stuff plus the deer, you know, and like my, my, I messed up my knee and I think it's cause I was not in the right shape my legs were not right i was not prepared and the stability especially going over uneven terrain walking all that crap out on your back and like oh, yeah. and just push i mean oh, we yeah. just we had decided we are not stopping we were gonna get out and like you know that's the mental part of it and we're gonna get to that in a minute but physically i'm still kind of paying for it you know yeah. um and it takes a long time for knees, knees to heal oh yeah yeah and that's one thing we're we're learning a lot right now we're just like the kettlebell program you're doing that was our first ever coach style program so in the app with preseason and postseason uh 45 70 30 30 those programs are all hey we're going to tell you what to do today and you're going to go do it uh kettlebell in the app is the first one where you just hit play and follow us the whole time yeah and so we call that coached versus self-guided. So all our other programs are self-guided. Kettlebell is coached. Um, we launched a couple of days ago a coached heavy pack program. And it'll be the same way where you just throw on your heavy pack, follow us for 30 to 45 minutes and compete with the athletes in the lab. And it is phenomenal what like a heavy pack will do to someone, someone who's even in like incredible physical condition. Cause there's just nothing that compares to heavy loads on your back, tight yeah. shoulder straps, tight chest strap, tight yep. hip belt. It's just different. Yeah. Yeah. It's putting a massive load on your, on, on part of your central nervous system. That's not usually getting worked. That was, that was what I found. Cause even going into our hunt, Jared, like I'm, I, yeah. I stay in fairly good shape, you know, and so I was like very surprised how dog tired I was when, especially when we got out. Dude, even like the first 500 yards, I was like, oh shit, I think yeah. I'm going to <laughs> oh, exactly. too much weight. <laughs> I remember when, when we first started walking, it was like, oh, because we went in with 50s or so pound uh, bags and it was yeah. probably a three or four mile walk in. Um. And we came out with that ish on our back, plus some deer, you know, and you're, you're pushing a hundred pounds. And it was just, it was, it was rough. Like my knee, Locked. like I said, my right knee, it would happen. It was in the back, back, like armpit at my knee pit, yeah. you know, like yeah. some muscle was, in there. Oh, I remember and, that. That was a gnarly pain, like yeah, a pain I had never felt before. And <laughs> that knee pain then. It has been hurting me, Jared. So I went to the chiropractor. I go fairly often Get and she, cracks. yeah. And she's been, she, it, what has been happening is that makes the front of my knee kind of where your, what your patella would be. I thought it was something wrong with my patella, but it's like a muscle in there that it fires off. And so yeah. I'll just be sitting down with all of a sudden it just, it'll go off. And it's yeah. like, holy cow. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, man, the day I turned 30 years old, which was three years ago, hard to believe not to brag about my age, Jared, uh, <laughs> but like all of a sudden, like I didn't ever had that, never had to think about that. Never had to worry. Like I could go hard and I would just bounce back no matter what I was doing. Yeah. But suddenly it's like, it's not muscle pain. There's other pains and aches that come with doing stuff now. <laughs> yeah. We talk about that a lot. Like the, you know, one of the predominant trends in, in backcountry hunting preparation is the comment, I'm just going to hike all the time. I'm going to be fine. Well, A, that's really unrealistic for a lot of people that don't have access to the mountains. And then right. B, what we found is like that only works in your 20s and 30s. And then in your 30s and 40s and 50s, it creates some major serious problems. So like the body's not going to recover as fast. 
and the endurance isn't going to be there. The strength's not going to be there. So what we're seeing a lot now is like a mountain athlete who's, who's not training in their thirties, forties, and fifties is going to have a super hard time. It's just, I, yeah, I, I, I took my dad out, out hunting yeah. <laughs> and we're going, <laughs> we're going down this way. We go, we're, we're working our way down this huge, huge decline. Right. And we're just checking. We actually got to the bottom and there was one of the bigger beaver sanctuaries I'd ever seen, like beaver <laughs> dam on dam. And then just a lodge that was like the size of a house. It was, it was incredible. Right. And so I'm like, all right, dad, you know, there's nothing down here. We got to go up, but let's just take the shortcut rather than take the kind of like the wind kind of windy way down. I was like, let's just go straight up. Yeah. And this was, I think I was in my twenties still. So I was still good. He, I remember we got a quarter of the way up. I looked back and I think my dad, if he could have had the strength to take his rifle down and shoot me, he would have, he was so mad. And so just like, I'd never seen him like that before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was like his, his, he was probably what in his fifties in his fifties. So yeah, you're 50 and you're, you're screwed. Yeah. Smoked. Smoked. It's, it's cool though. Like, cause the, the guys that do train in their fifties and even into their sixties can just be beasts. Like yeah. they can be mountain beasts past 60 years old if they train right and that's pretty badass that's that's really and that's the goal i mean that's what we jared and i kind of talk about i just want to be able to move well so i can hunt as long as i can yeah the way that i like to which even we're from michigan right so it's it's totally different uh you know it's not climbing mountains but it is some of the places we go like you're either you're paddling a kayak out or you're walking through a you know knee-deep swamp for a mile you know, or whatever it is, it's still not, I, I still want to be able to do that. I don't want to be that guy that's got that bad knee or that, mm -hmm. you know, my hips kill me back. My back's out again. I don't want, or my shoulders, you know, I don't want any of that. I want to just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. It's that fit kind of fit for life mentality. Yeah. And be able to move well, move well. Yeah. I've been doing, uh, and I, I like to brag to the, about this too. I've been doing yoga with Adrian uh don't like to do yoga but i've been realized it is a, a a female youtube video channel it's not the thing is don't it's not sexual jared don't even go there like <laughs> he gets his yoga pants on and it's down it's there. she's she's fine yoga people are weird and for people who listen to this i'm sorry my wife does yoga too but it's really good because i so i done a, i did a lot of sports growing up jared you did a lot of sports growing up but i never stretched yeah. ever i just never would skip it i'd screw around it like during stretch time at practice i just wouldn't you know yeah. and i got by with it for a long long time well all of a sudden it's like i can't i'm so inflexible it's like affecting my life and <laughs> i know it's affecting how much how much i get out of a workout yeah right so i so prior to even starting mountain fit i'm like before, i i always say i'm gonna do it i am committing to doing yoga five days a week right and so i've been doing it and jared not to brag i'm a i'm almost two months in I bet I could out stretch you. You probably, you get, I guarantee, Jared, you're still more flexible than me. I hate it because, yeah, I hate it. yoga sucks because it's like, I'm just going to sit here, be a little sweaty and uncomfortable and just stay that way for, for like 30 seconds at a time. I'm like, you know, the, I'm like the human form of Gumby. Gumberculeus. You got muscle, you got flexibility, you got everything. Kind of slime around. No, Jared, you are, you are pretty flexible. And here's the thing. I know you do it on purpose. Like we'll be hanging out and you're like, hang on a second. Hang on a second. You'll stand up and you'll just be like, I do not do that on yes, purpose. You, there yes, are times you where you just stretch. Yeah. stretch. And flexes by stretching. It's a weird flex. <laughs> and sometimes you just got to get into that like runner's pose and you just got to. You really don't out. though. The average person doesn't do that. You do it. It's not <laughs> in that I can't, but I'm going to. It's not. I don't do it on purpose. It's just like, you know what, man, I'm standing here. I could just stretch for a second. You guys are just chatting away. I'm just going to stretch a I'm, second. I, my goal is one day, just not say anything. You're going to be talking to somebody else. I'm going to be like, oh, hang on a minute. And just go into the splits and be like, oh, I yeah. just, this is what I do. I just split. I do the split sometime. I would the only reason I'm doing yoga is for that right there. Full split. the splits. Yeah, just full. The, not the easy <laughs> out this way. I mean, like legs out like this, like the hard kind of splits. Like the flat flat arcs on the ground yeah, not the front not like one up not one up one down that's no <laughs> that's cheating that's the easy way so um so dustin <clears throat> a lot of what you do you know like i said prior to this reading a bunch of articles i had a great quote about that you posted about you know goals versus uh system for like yeah. accomplishing something which was great 
Um, but I think a lot of what you do is also mental focused, um, which not a lot of uh, things like this are. I mean, I was telling my wife when I started doing this, I'm like, you know, remember when we tried, we did that P90X it's like that, but like way better, you know, and, and aside from the workouts, which are great, it helps with some of this mental toughness, which for anybody who's done backcountry hunting, there's certainly a physical aspect to it, but there's always a point on a hunt where you're like, well, I could just do the easy thing or just sleep in or whatever, or not. And there's like, it's, so it's, it's a big mental part of it too. And you, you pay a lot of attention to that. It seems like. Yeah. So mental toughness is everything for us. It's definitely like our number one ethos that we run everything through that we're doing. And most of that is baked in kind of like you saw in the program. So yeah. the, one of the only ways to make someone more mentally tough is to put them through adversity and then put them through it again and again. And, and they they know that they can go there now. And so the next time you ask them to go to that point of pain or exertion, uh, it's much easier for them so that it becomes no problem. So we want to push people extremely hard in the gym or in the app or in these workouts so that when they do run into a similar situation in the back country, they're good to go. They've been there before their heart rate has been there that high before they've been that tired before. Uh, so that it's not a surprise because once it's a, a surprise, that mental fear factor starts coming in, which can really shut someone down. And so mental toughness was always what we were after. And it, it's almost more important than the physical because we know that if we can make an athlete extremely mentally tough, then they're going to accomplish all these goals that they're training for anyways. And so right. if, if someone is extremely mentally tough, they're going to, they're going to stay that extra day on the mountain or they're going to stay four hours through that snowstorm, or they're going to push three ridges further back when they wanted to quit. And that's where the animals are going to be. And so mental toughness is, is huge. And for mountain tough, it's a lot more, of if we can make someone extremely mentally tough then we know they're also going to be a way better husband a way better boss a way better employee they're just going to be better at life in general and for us that's really important because i think what we always talk talk about is most of our athletes are gonna they're gonna subscribe to mountain tough for a hunt. So they're going to subscribe for this big hunt that they have planned this year and they're going to start training. But what we know is the, the, the hunt is not the end game because they're going to go on that hunt and then they're going to come home from that hunt and they're going to have to play with their kids, hike with their kids, hang out with their kids. Uh, they're going to have to perform at work that week. And for someone to really train for decades versus train for a year, then like hunting can't be the end game, even though that's what got them in the, in the door. And for them to stick around for a decade or so, they need to be, they need to work on that mental toughness, if not more or just as much as that physical side. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the coming back and being okay after a hunt, I, regularly will come back and i'm sh so shot even like jared like for some reason when we do turkey hunting every year mm. like our turkey seasons are short so when we go like you it's like go. all day and i come back from turkey hunting i think that's when i'm most tired for, for yeah. some reason just because i'm all excited it's a couple days i love to turkey hunt yeah and you get back home and it's like oh, <laughs> oh this is the worst <laughs> um, but you you brought up something um about mental toughness. And that just made me wonder, like, have you found a pessimist versus an optimist? It, you know, is, is an optimist more mentally tough, able to keep pushing, or does it not matter so much about pessimism or optimism in terms of who you are? Yeah, that's a huge part of it. So um, the, the most mentally tough people that, that we've found in all our research are certainly a lot more optimistic. And so 
the the extremely competitive person can be very mentally tough because competitive and mental toughness are are very closely linked but the competitive positive person who's mentally tough like 99% of the time is going to outperform that negative competitive mentally yeah. tough person so usually you see this on the mountain where someone is um be like day five of a nasty backcountry elk hunt and uh, the optimistic person will be stuck in the middle of a blizzard and it'll be like negative 20 and they'll look at you smiling and say hell at least it's not negative 40 this is yeah awesome. <laughs> right like that that switch that they're able to flip where something could always be a little bit worse and they're just glad to be out there they're just glad to be on the mountain that person always beats the negative person like the the negative mentally tough competitive person they'll be up there and they'll be crushing it on day five but they'll usually be so grouchy about that blizzard and that blizzard kind of was the cap on that negativity that they'll be like screw it let's get out of here we'll come back another day yeah so that the positive attitude is is huge for it's linked to mental toughness yeah yeah absolutely and, and it just it made me think of it because i was saw this posted somewhere it's a we have never quoted steve ranella on this podcast everybody knows who steve ranella is uh but it was a great quote um it said a pessimist brain is fine as long as it's paired with the boots of an optimist and i like that because like you can sometimes it's actually good to be pessimistic about certain things when you're hunting you know um and like especially when you're about to shoot like you know what i'm, I'm not going to get a shot and what, you know, as you're getting ready and it kind of helps calm you down and send it, you know, and then you just <laughs> shoot it right over the back. No, you know what I'm saying though? You like need to be able to say like, all right, I'm not going to get a shot. It's fine. Just stay calm. This deer's and you're never going to get a chance. And then it comes a little closer and you're kind of like, I I've heard a lot of people say to me, that's what they, that's the way that they talk to themselves when before a shot, cause it helps them stay calm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a scientifically proven point. It's called pessimistic optimism which is kind of a, <laughs> a pessimistic optimism is that idea. Like if you're crushing someone in the gym on an eight round workout, they'll, they'll laugh and say, it's not, at least it's not 10 rounds. We're only doing eight. Right. And it, it's such a mental switch. It, it, it works like every time. And that's how they're talking to themselves. They're like, you know, they're, they're, they know it's an eight round workout but they're talking to themselves like I could do this for 10 or 12 or 14 rounds. And so I think that that voice inside of their head becomes extremely important. And we did a study last year on like everyone has this voice inside of their head that's leading to mental toughness and about half the population is negative and half of the population is positive. And some of the most famous mentally tough people in the world go negative and they do crazy things so if you think about like the uh the david goggins type story so david mm. goggins um running the bad water ultra um it, and he talks very vocally about it's all this negative voice inside of his head he he's talking down on the old goggins in his head to get himself through these very difficult situations. So all the research has indicated that the negative voice might be more powerful than the positive, but it's, it's uh, short burning fuel. Sure. So, so the negative uh, influence in your head can get you through some of the hardest things. And so if you research like uh, the 10 most mentally tough athletes in the world, they usually had this really traumatic childhood. They had something crazy that happened to them growing up and they're using that old trauma as fuel to push harder than like any other human in the world, but they're not gonna do that for 10 or 20 or 30 years. So like we work with a lot of our athletes that are like that to try to switch it positive. Like it's not about this trauma when you were a child anymore it's about like, what kind of father do you want to be to your, to your kids for the next 20 years? And that negative fuel is not going to really go well in that, in that new sure. life. And so the negative fuel is crazy powerful, but we call it, um, 
short burning fuel in terms of it's not going to keep them super motivated for a long time in a healthy way. Sure. Yeah. Cause you end up like hating yourself. For, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. No, so it's, yeah. That is a phenomenal book, by the way. If you haven't had a chance to read David Goggins, Can't Hurt Me, that's probably one of my favorite books that I've read, at least in the recent history of mine. Yeah. Um, like as soon as you read it and you're like, you're hooked. You start like going through all of his buds training uh, for the seals, everything he had to endure there, like his knee flaming up and having to go through it. Well, I think it was three times he had to go through and he finally, yeah. I'm not going to ruin the rest of it, but it's just the way that he talks about that mental toughness and just overcoming all of the obstacles that he had to do. It's just, it's crazy. It motivates you. And that's what pushed me to get, I think it was for a whole winter. I was waking up early and going on a run in the morning just yeah. to get out there in the cold and just say to myself, Hey, you're going to get up and you're going to go run in the frigid cold. Yeah. You're not going to yeah. like it, but you're going to do it anyway. Cause it's good for you. And there would be times it would be four degrees outside and there I am huffing and puffing. But yeah. what happens when you do that and you're deciding to do something you don't want to do, I feel like that that's like a domino effect. You push that domino and the rest of your life, you decide to do the right thing. Again, quote somebody else. I was just listening to the Remy Warren podcast and he said, but I, another thing that stuck with me, go the best way, not the easiest way, right? Thought that was another great, great line to remember. I don't know about that, man. No. We, we, we tried that route on the, the best, that us, the that best way, dark place. the best way is better than the easy way. Right. Uh, and once you, once you're waking up and you're running, right. You've decided to do that. Well, then the rest of the day, when those little decisions come up that you're like, well, you know, no, one's really looking, yep. I could just kind of do this and it would be a lot easier. Um, but it wouldn't be the, you know what I'm saying? Once you make it once, it's easier to make it again. Yeah. And that yeah, well, sets off the rest of your life in, a, in the right direction, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I've even I've even read and, and heard that if you if you're up exercising early in the morning, you're more likely to make better food decisions throughout the day. Sure. sure. Like simple, just little, hey, I don't really want to eat that snack. I just ran this morning. Yeah, dude, I'm the opposite. When Are you I that the, <laughs> now I, every, when I wake up right to the honey bun? I just, I'm like, Hey man, I worked out. I am, I burn a lot. Like my, I burn a lot of calories. You know, I'm fairly, I'm skinnier, you know? And so I can just eat and like, I'm like, well, just load me up. You know what I'm saying? I'll take two, whatever that is. You need the fuel, to burn the fire. That's what we, got. we won't get but into I, that, but it's, it's funny though. It's been rough. I, I work out in my garage, which is detached and we've been cold. It's been cold this January mm -hmm. here. And so going out there when it's like single digits and I got this little stupid space heater, which does not, unless you stand right in front of it, I'm, I'm working out with hats and like gloves and I got these big old big gloves on. Right. And, uh, what I've liked about mountain tough is I get you warm pretty fast, like pretty quickly. I'm like shed layers, you know, feeling pretty good out there, but <laughs> It is good to get, I don't know what it is. It's good to be like really uncomfortable every day. Yes. Yeah. 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 Doing something challenging every day is a game changer. And traditionally Jared's point is accurate that most people will get like <laughs> a positive snowball. So they're usually like, I worked out. I'm not going to sabotage my workout mm -hmm. by, by eating bad at lunch. And then it's usually the opposite where someone who is not working out is like, oh, I didn't work out today. I might as well. Screw it. No. Yeah, screw it. Yeah. Two donuts. Well, here's the thing, though. For me, my bad eating day is different than the, the average man's eating day. We, I, Our family is a very, we, we had a, like, so we had a You're bunch very of, clean eating. You, you very I clean. eat a clean diet. Like, very I don't, clean. I haven't eaten, I haven't had a, a speck of gluten in like 10, 10 years at least. No yep. dairy. I've, I, I've tried a little cheese, but like, I eat vegetables. Like my, my indulgence is I'll have a second helping of kale, please. You know, just load me up on a little bit more kale today. And, uh, which believe it or not, all the vegetables that you eat, you actually give off a, a different smell. Do I? Mm -hmm. Like bad? Like I mean, even, even, I mean, I hate to say this, but because <laughs> everyone loves their own brand. Like hey. when you rip ass sometimes, 
It oh, smells well. like a, like a cow fart. Oh, dude, it it smells good. It no, smells it doesn't. Good. It's just like, ah, oh, dude. I have a sensitive Lay constitution. Off the <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I do. That's why I had to eat this way in the first place. <laughs> yeah, right. You, are you just telling me you don't like the smell of my farts? <laughs> all, I'm, all I'm saying is, you just got. I'm not. Everyone's got a stink about them, right? Some people have really bad ones that smells like a wet rag. Or Other like garlic are, or like... Yeah, you know, like that's all depending on what you eat. It comes out of your pores. What do I smell like? Oils. This is huge for me. I don't know this. <laughs> you, you never I told don't know. me this. You smell like vegetable broth. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I eat a lot of breast. You know what? I eat a lot of bone broth. <laughs> that's not going to lie. Broth and onion. I'm not going to apologize for it. Deal with it. You know? That's all I'm saying. Like you just... It's not a it's not a bad smell. I'm just saying, like you are what you eat. <laughs> you are. I'm and which is a lot of vegetables and weird meat. Everybody gives me a hard time for like the the funny things that I eat from animals, but hey man, eating healthy. Clean, you eat clean eating. Clean. Respect um, it. That's so anyways, yeah. So I just kind of dial it like turning back the clock, right? What why did you decide to get into this in the first place? Why like you know, this you've you've started, I mean, obviously you started in the kind of exercise space but you started going hunting and you've gone into studying physical and mental toughness in just variety of ways but like at the very beginning what what why did you take this turn in life yeah it's been a crazy journey so i was a montana kid a lifelong kind of bow hunter grew up bow hunting with my dad we grew up in eastern montana outside of billings and so I started archery hunting elk with my dad around when I was 12. And so archery elk hunting was kind of it. That was our full-time year-long pursuit, shooting bows in the backyard and, and training for that. And then as I grew older, just started bouncing around the West, trying to hunt elk in as many states as possible. And then I went to college in Montana at Montana State for business and entrepreneurship and graduated and just land landed like this dream job on paper. So it was crazy in terms of it was this crazy high paying job. I was 23 and the job was a corporate think tank concept. And so we would, we would interview 10 to 12 C-level executives from non-competing industries and they would share ideas. So for example, the first group I had was like the COO of Nike, the COO of UPS, uh, chief operating officer of Starbucks. So I was 23 interviewing some of the most powerful business ex executives in the world learning a ton um the, the executives loved it because they're sharing ideas so like the coo of ups was dying to talk to the coo of american airlines they just never had that connection and we made that connection and so hypothetically it was like a dream job um but i was so bored and i was so bored of being stuck in the office all day we were on the phone like 12 hours a day in these tiny little cubicles and it just wasn't scratching my like challenge and my physical itch and my wife and I after graduating college we had gotten super into ultra marathons and marathons and so in that that all this stuff was kind of coming together and my wife was the passionate runner. So she was the one who got like the runners high and just loved running. And I hated running, but I just liked uh, the physical benefits of the challenge. And then we started getting into the ultras and the ultras were, in my mind, I thought it was the perfect fit. And so the ultra was 50 miles in the mountains a lot of times it was the exact same mountains that we were going to be bow hunting in later that year. So I was like, man, this is absolutely the, the perfect way to train for a Western backcountry elk hunter was just to run these mountain races because you get an incredible amount of endurance. And so we did that um, for a few years and 
it became extremely apparent the next year when I went elk hunting and killed a bull and went to pack out the heavy loads that all that endurance had backfired. So I was too lean. I lost um, too much muscle. And so I could crush it in the mountains all day long, but I could not handle the heavy loads of the pack out like I used to be able to. And that's really when the light bulb moment went off. It was like, man, there's gotta be a way to break down the science and train a mountain athlete exactly for this mission. And so that was the, the, the kind of light bulb moment for mountain tough. It took a delay though. So uh, as all this was going on, um, my wife and I did this event where we ran a marathon a month for a year uh, to raise to raise money for this nonprofit in Africa. What nonprofit? Um, so that nonprofit, I don't think they're around anymore. Um, they were rescuing children that lived in the landfill in Ethiopia. So at the end of the year, we went and visited them after raising all this raising money through these marathons and basically get on the ground and there are a group of like 50 kids that live in the landfill so it would be like your local dump um so they sleep there they eat there they live there and so they were kind of going through the landfill looking for scraps to eat and then they would go they would like pick through the dump with sticks and then they would find plastic bottles and aluminum cans to recycle in town for money mm -hmm. and that was their full-time job and that was their full-time life and they were they were like five six seven eight nine ten years old and that led us to coming home so we came home i went back to this really good job in Bozeman. My wife worked at an advertising agency, which was an awesome job for our age and our lifestyle. And we were like, we were wrecked from that Ethiopia trip. Yeah, I can believe that. We we're like back in these plush corporate jobs after everything we had just seen. And like we had nieces and nephews that same age and we, were, we didn't have any kids at that time. And we were like, man, we gotta, we might as well do something now if we're gonna do it. So we both quit our jobs and we flew back to Africa and worked there for another year. And where'd so- you work in, Where'd you work that time, same place? We went to a different place. Um, we went to Uganda and we worked- In for what year? We went to Uganda in, this was 09, it was 09 and 10. Okay. Okay. All right. And so we actually, through a Bozeman connection, worked for a guy that had been. So Joseph Coney came through Africa um, using the child soldiers and massacred like 600,000 people through that civil war with Sudan. And so we, he, his foundation was rescuing kids from that war and he had started this new orphanage and the idea was um, to teach all the kids their life skills so they weren't stuck in orphanages the rest of their life and so it was a very entrepreneurship focused campus it was super it was super incredible it was like still the most rewarding challenging best thing we have ever done and we thought we were gonna do it forever. Um, we, we, there's 240 kids there. Um, my wife was running like the medical clinic. I was helping the kids um, like do this pineapple farm. We'd sell the pineapples. They'd take that money, save that money for their secondary education. And we built this little guest house, moved into this guest house and my wife got pregnant and still, even at that time, we were, we were, we had no plan B. That was kind of what we thought we were doing for a while. And we did not, we knew, we knew we didn't want to deliver the baby 
in Uganda just with right. how sketchy it is. Um, so we were like, we'll fly home to Bozeman, have the baby fly back, lived in, live in the guest house. And we flew back. Um, our first daughter was born and, uh, we just, we just could not fly back over there and, and raise a newborn baby right. under, <laughs> under those kind of like safety conditions. Um, but what we did know is like everything we'd learned through this whole process was that we wanted to do something related to our passion and our purpose. And we did not want to go back and just snag up a corporate job. And that finally was when all those mountain tough pieces came together. Mm. <laughs> so it was a long journey, but it, it's cool kind of looking back at it now and all the pieces it took to get here. Yeah. What a crazy, so the Lord's resistance army stuff you were dealing with. I mean, remember that movie, Jared uh, Coney, 2000, 2012. Remember that Jared? Do you remember that? Were you around for that? Mm -mm. Um, Jared was stationed. I don't know if you saw that or not, but yeah, it was like stunning. So what, what yeah. this dude was doing, like shocking, shocking Insane. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We had kids at the orphanage that would, we had this little land cruiser that we'd buzz around into town for and get supplies. And it, it got like four flat tires in one week and we couldn't figure out what was going on. Well, this like 10 year old boy was building booby traps and putting them in the road and we kept, and he was, it was a boy that was staying with us, was so used to building booby traps for the civil war that he was just like doing it out of habit. And we kept hitting him with the land cruiser. Oh. It, it was just crazy stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Cause he'd start young with kids yeah. and just like kind of brainwash them. Right. Yeah. I mean, turn them into his army, which was yeah. Horrible, but what a, I mean, what a, what a journey from corporate to Africa to, you <laughs> yeah. know, like basically training world-class athletes in Bozeman, Montana, which is a beautiful place. Bozeman is awesome. I always stop by all the cool, I mean, there's like the Sitka place there, Stone Glacier, you guys are there and I'll, I'll like the cool stuff. I think Meat Eater's there, right? No. So whenever I drive through, I like do like the, the fanboy tour stuff, but uh <laughs> That's like really you, cool. you've just you've gone all over the place and wait where you went to uh what'd you say university of montana state is that right in bozeman yeah i went to montana state in bozeman montana state yeah i was gonna say i remember we stopped by the campus last time we were there um it's a beautiful spot and yeah. good hunting like look at the flex behind him jared he's got two mm -hmm. big bucks sitting there and he's got <laughs> wow a goat we don't i don't know that we've had a guest with such a strong goat flex uh <laughs> <laughs> wow i mean i'm sitting here with nothing on my wall jared's got his bare, his bare. Got concrete behind me <laughs> yeah uh, but i i was pointing out to jared before i got this map here that like explains different geographical features so it's got like you know here what here's what a dam looks like a lake a plateau about that thing yeah it's it's pretty cool here's a shoal and there's like a list of terms in the bottom and uh because we always have this debate about whether it's a draw, a shoot, or a, what's the other term for it, Jared? Ravine. A ravine, or like I call it different things. He doesn't like that I call anything that is like an indent in the land a shoot. Because it could be like a drainage, I'm calling that a shoot. It's all, or a holler, I'm a calling holler. that a shoot. A holler. It's a draw. Draw. <laughs> yeah. So, that's awesome. well, that's cool. You know, I've, I've, what I've liked about just kind of dialing it back to what you were saying earlier about some of your workouts now are like you, you work with other people, work out with people mm -hmm. rather than kind of self-paced. It's kind of nice because what I like about it is you're seeing these people push and it's like, man, you know, it's, it's 630 in the morning. <laughs> it's f 10 degrees. Like I just, I'm just going to just get it over with. And I see somebody on the, like a little phone that I've propped up on a table in my garage that I have the heater on. Cause I'm worried that my phone battery will die in the cold. Uh, and it's like, well, they're doing it. So it's it kind of, it's motivating, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that was kind of by design. And one thing that we wanted to do that for was I think the wall sits like a perfect example so that program you're in now with the kettlebell program the wall sit challenge ramps up each week Dude. and what <laughs> what we didn't want we didn't want someone at home to be like 
dude, you can't like a, a five minute kettlebell wall sit is impossible. No one can do that. What the hell are these guys talking right. about? No one's going to do this without breaks. And so just like we knew it pushed you to a whole new level. If you're sitting there on your wall, staring at someone on our wall and you're going to push it like a hundred times further than you would if that example isn't there. Yeah. It, it's just like the power of, um, it's almost accountability a little bit. It is. That's exactly, that's what I think of it is like, they're doing it. I got to keep up with them. Yeah. Um, I like that. Is that now tell me that's the hardest workout, like the kettlebell work, uh, you know, program is the hard, is that the hardest one? No, no, it definitely isn't the hardest I didn't, one. I didn't think it was. What's, what's the <laughs> hardest one? That's what I'm doing next. So I can show Jared how tough I am. Man, I, I think they're all, they're all hard in different ways. The one thing that's been cool for me to witness has been, I think there's this concept that we have as a society, as a world, we're still a long ways from scratching this, this human potential thing. And I've always kind of believed that. And I used to use the example that if you look at if you look at athletes today compared to like when I was a kid watching football, like when I was a kid watching football with my dad at like 10 years old, they were kind of like normal looking dudes. Right. And now it is, they're complete freak, like human animals and they're faster and bigger than ever before. And it's like that. And it's like that in every sport and, like football is the easy example because visually you can just see how these guys are beasts. But I also saw it in ultra running. Sure. Where like when I was, when my wife and I kind of were into ultras, a uh, hundred miles was like the, the crucible. Like, can you, can you do the hundred miler? So a lot yeah. of people, that was like what they were shooting for was that the hundred miler was it. If you've done that, you are kind of triple digits. Yeah. You're in the community. Well, like it was just a few years later that they bumped it up to 250. Yeah. So, like over doubled it. That blew my yeah. 100 blew my mind at the time. Yeah. I remember when I would see Cam Haynes practicing for a hundred mile and then running a hundred mile race. And I remember telling people like this guy runs 100 miles. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is years ago, and now it's like 250 is a thing. It's ridiculous. 250 is the thing now. Yeah, it's insane. And that Here's was the thing, like, though, we knew this since like the eight, the early ni- mid 90s. If you, you've seen Forrest Gump, that dude runs across the whole country. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, like, I mean, we've known it was possible for a while. You just got to yeah. tap into your inner Gump, you know? It was his beard, I think. That got him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, I guess tying that back to the point is we're seeing that with mountain tough, like the workouts that we wrote in 2016, we've learned so much since 16 that I almost always recommend like the new thing because everything we've learned about mountain athletes compounds on itself into the next program and the next program and the next program. So like the, the heavy pack 20 we released last week, is phenomenal it's just like six years of mountain athlete research and all you need is your pack yeah. and that i would say is the 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 coolest and the most challenging one right now and same thing it's just coached someone can put their pack on in their garage in their living room in their bedroom, in a hotel room, at the office, and just hit play, and that's all they need to do. But the stuff that's incorporated into that program, I feel is going to make a way stronger hunter than anything we've ever done, just because the athletes we have testing that are freak athletes, but what they're experiencing under the heavy load of the pack across four weeks, I'm very confident they'll feel better in the mountains off that program than anything we've ever done. Well, I've got a a bear hunt in Montana, Western Montana coming up, which is kind of why I started to get serious about getting, you know, in shape and especially working on my legs. Um, And so I was looking at that heavy pack as next after I finish 
finish yeah. kettlebell. That was what I had my set, especially because you have somebody doing the workout with you. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were just talking about today in the gym. We were like, I can't wait to see the people that do all the kettlebell and then all the heavy pack workouts because it's functional strength yeah. and functional strength is very different than just strength. It's like farmer strong. And yeah, exactly. And that's, and hunters need a lot of that, like farmer strong, uh, grip strength and stability, uh, that you, that you can't always get with perfectly balanced weights and dumbbells. Right. Yeah. You're uneven. You're kind of shifting the bag around. I am concerned about my bag stinking. Yeah, I've yeah. got this this nice stone glacier backpack, you know, and I'm worried it's just gonna get that stink to it. I I already I just cleaned the uh the bag, yeah. But like the straps, although who wrote somebody just messaged me and said you can actually throw take out the the um metal stays or whatever in the backpack and throw it in your your washing machine too. So it, maybe I'll try that. Yeah, we we <laughs> we so one of our test athletes on the heavy pack twenty program is. Chris Lawrence, who's the, he is the warehouse manager for Stone Glacier. And because our buildings are right next door. Yeah, so we, yeah. we bring him over and he's a huge dude. He's like, he's 240. Uh, he was a linebacker uh, for Cal Poly. So, but he's in love with this functional training now, but we asked him that question today. We're like, dude, these packs by the end of all these people testing this program are just driving demand for them. Yeah. <laughs> but he said there's a YouTube on how to wash that whole thing. Good. So, I'm going to need that. Cause I'm like, you know, I, I take it on, I whitetail hunt. I'm like, I can't have, you know, be stinking out the woods, you know? Yeah. Apparently I smell like bra. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah, Thanks dude. Jared. I'm really Broth self-conscious you, about that now. Throwing a little ketchup and you got a little, little meal ew <laughs> yuck no, no i'm uh, i'm yeah. super excited like this is all this talk and talk of you know mental toughness and everyone getting on board and doing this stuff together i'm no no me, you know what makes, don't give me this no it makes you me want why to no i reject all this <laughs> Pick a hunt man pick what you're doing here's the thing that drives me crazy about jared i'm airing my grievance right now What's i've that? had you know the cr- clock strikes strikes 12 o'clock December 30, right into January 1, 31st, 31st to January 1. Anyways, New Year's. And I've got all my hunts planned. I'm excited. I'm thinking about them. I'm researching them. Right, Jared, where, where are you going hunting this year? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Train for something. I'll man. let it come to me, man. <laughs> you let me know how that goes. I will. And I am going to start a workout now because I'm super. For what? Hungry. For what hunt? Doesn't matter. Does it I'm matter? Business. I- I, I want to know. Figure it out. I want to. I want to go to this app, Dustin. Where can I find this app? Like, where can I download it? Like, is, is it everywhere? Yep, it's everywhere. So, uh, Mountain Tough Plus is the app. You can access it in the iPhone Store, the Google Play Store. It's also sweet. It's incredible on TVs, and so it is oh, in the Apple TV Store, the Roku Store. Uh, I'm not trying that yet. I need a TV for my garage. It's sweet on the TV, especially these coached ones are phenomenal. Um, are you a coach on there? Yeah, of course. He's there the whole time, man. He he holds your hand <laughs> yes. gently, holds your hand and guides you as your Yoda and just tells you, hey, there's another round of AMRAP. Just to get used to am- the word AMRAP, Jared. Oh, You're going to learn to love it. Possible. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. Anyway, no, I'm I'm super excited. If you guys have been listening to this episode and have found an inner calling to get fit for whatever hunts that's coming up, or if you just want to get in shape like I do, because you got that dad bod going on, or you got a dad whatever, bod for whatever reason, for whatever sure. reason, you got a dad bod, Jared. I'm working on it. Mm, it's a work in progress. Hey, you know what? I can't be friends with somebody that's over <laughs> over like I I can't be friends with a dude that's got dad about i'm sorry i that's i have right. high standards of friendship and you're well, gonna get the you're gonna get you're on the chopping block right now my friend get it together <laughs> tighten it I'm up getting it together i'm gonna go down with this app everyone else should too go go check out the app dustin also follow check them out on yeah. instagram uh you guys have good posts and like your blog posts are good like i said i had a really good uh nugget the other day that i've been you know 
kind of thinking about since I read it. So yeah, check that out too. That was, do you, do you write those Dustin? Yeah, I do. I write most of them. And then a few other guys on our team, write Some of them, the, the blog content, we're trying to make it all a mental toughness focus. So the, the majority of it is mental toughness focused blog content, which is super fun. Yeah. And then the, the awesome thing about the app too, is that you, everyone can start on that 14 day free trial, which we think is sweet because it's just getting people in there. They can try a few different workouts. They can try the coach style or the self-guided style, a uh, ton of bonus content in there. They can check out too. And then no commitment after that 14 days. How long are the workouts while we're on those? Then? So the, each program is different in terms of if you pick a gym program or a no gear program or a minimal gear program. Mm -hmm. um, but our, our yeah. concept average is we've always wanted people to be able to get it done within an hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It usually is. I think the longest one with like cool down. And sometimes I skip cool down, Dustin. I don't what? skip it. I no, like no, no, no. Listen, cool down five times. I do yoga afterwards <laughs> and I count that because okay. I'm like, I don't want to do a cool down and yoga. That like, that's a lot of things that aren't very fun. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not the expert. I'm just telling, I'm just being honest and, you know, just unloading my conscience because you're finally here. You don't, you can't judge me when I, you're on my phone in the garage in the morning, but you can judge me now. You know, we can see you through that. <laughs> That's the weird thing about data, yeah. data mining, man. No, it's been awesome. Um, I appreciate having you on. Actually the quote was, and I keep referring to it. Goals don't determine success systems determine success. And that's been just stuck in my cross since, since I read it, it's just been bouncing yeah. around. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. thanks man yeah for us that 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 is not my quote but it was in our article james clear that's yeah. the quote <laughs> so it, coined it man Should've it's all about it. for us it's all about like everything you do you got to tie into identity and that's the only way it's going to stick so um we always use the example of like don't don't train for the hunt this year like train to be a better husband because yeah. that's gonna, that's going to be the long-term fuel that keeps you going you gotta have that top shelf stuff for your wife you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> yes baby you don't want to you, you know you're not digging out of like well stuff this is yeah. top shelf you know bring this your best ain't, this ain't uh el toro we're no. talking about the <laughs> that's right it just isn't your yeah yeah exactly <laughs> 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 uh, anyways, well, hey, man, thank you for coming on appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to our nonsense for a while and and motivating jared to lose that dad bod yeah he has been i have noticed some handles he's getting he gets handles he's the bottom heavy dude you gotta rage you know? against the dad bod yeah uh, you do it's not it's not attractive i don't care what people magazine <laughs> says about it being in it's not it's never gonna be in stay tight <laughs> keep things tight keep it tight <laughs> anyways dustin i appreciate it like i said go everybody check it out uh i've been doing this workout for two weeks jared's uh gonna be one day in tomorrow yeah if anyone wants to start with me he'll, he'll post hey, it jared, i want to see a post about it tomorrow morning prior to work uh, he works early man. too yeah not gonna happen after download it. download it now download it now jared okay all right dustin you, thank you everybody. again appreciate your time thanks appreciate the opportunity really uh that was super fun and anything you guys need just let us know